Jesus spoke his seven last words under the most desperate circumstances, after he'd been nailed to a cross and left to die. Only the most faithful could then have believed the promise of what was to follow, the raising of Jesus from the dead, the resurrection. Many believed Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of God and Savior of mankind. He was therefore a threat to those in power. He predicted that he would suffer and die at their hands, but would be raised from the dead by God three days later. He anticipated that someone close to him would betray him and that others would eventually desert him. After sharing the Last Supper with his disciples, Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he had gone to pray. It was one of his most devoted followers, Judas, who had betrayed him. He was brought before the governor, Pontius Pilate, who conveniently washed his hands of the matter by allowing the volatile crowd to determine Jesus' fate. Mob justice prevailed, and they demanded that Jesus be put to death using the most painfully cruel method of execution known to man. The soldiers stripped him naked, they draped a scarlet robe around him, and attached a crown of razor-sharp thorns to his head. They ridiculed him, they spat on him, they savagely beat him before finally dragging him away to be crucified with two common thieves. Jesus was forced to carry his own cross up the hill to the killing area at Calvary, a location appropriately known as the Place of the Skull. Deserted by all but one of his disciples, he was nailed to the cross, spikes driven through his hands and feet, and he suffered a prolonged and excruciating death. A tremendous earthquake immediately followed. Let's return now to those torturous final hours when Jesus was hanging from the cross, life being drained from him, moment by agonizing moment. Despite the intense pain, despite the humiliation, despite the overwhelming despair of having been so utterly betrayed and abandoned, he was somehow at peace, his judgment more sure, his inspiration more vivid, his faith more profound than ever. It was in these moments of ultimate physical torment and spiritual ecstasy that he uttered his final fateful words, the seven last words of Christ.
when they had come to the place called Calvary. There they crucified him along with the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Here is this amazingly magnanimous Jesus. He hangs there on the cross between two thieves. Notice, he doesn't curse or swear at those who were responsible for putting him there, as some of us might have done. He simply prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is true agape love demonstrated at its best. A love that does not focus on self or circumstances. A love that does not hold grudges or seek revenge, but rather redeems. No wonder the hymn writer could pen the words, Ere since by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be until I die. How about you? Does Jesus Christ's example truly make the difference in the way you treat those who hurt, ridicule, or abuse you? Does his example truly make the difference in the way you face life and the way you must ultimately face death? If Easter 2002 is to have any real meaning for you, then why not experience the power of Christ's forgiving love as you too pray the prayer for your enemies? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do.
today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. I have a confession to make, and it is this. I am notorious for getting lost while driving, but that's not the real problem. I am notorious for not asking for directions. <laughs> it is a man thing, I have been told. I may be lost, but I always know where I am. It is where I am going that is the problem. <laughs> the thief on the cross knew where he was. He was on the cross hanging there as the just reward of his deeds. He did not offer an alibi or an apology. He did not explain himself as a victim of circumstances. He was what he was. He knew what he was. And he knew where he was. His co-conspirator on the cross understood that, and with an irreverence that shocks even now, he mocked Jesus with the cry, we all know and use. If you're so smart, how come you're up here with us? These crucified criminals are not uninformed. They know who Jesus is supposed to be. They had heard of his mighty wonder working. Perhaps they had even heard of his raising of Lazarus from the dead. Compared to that, getting them down from the cross would be a piece of cake. If thou art the Christ, save thyself and us then. Don't just stand there, do something. They know where they are. But the second thief is like you and like me. He is lost, not because he doesn't know where he is. He's lost because he doesn't know where he is going. So, very much unlike me, at least he stops and he asks for direction. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingly power. This is an act of faith. He places himself in the care of one who would appear to be no better off than he. And he asks to be delivered to a place of kingly power, the very thought of which is mocked by the obscene reality of the cross itself. But he can see beyond that. This thief has what we call insight, a light that transcends what one can literally see. And he moves not by sight, but by faith. It seems too good to be true, too uncomplicated. But at death's door, things get pretty simple, pretty basic, pretty clear, pretty uncomplicated. The words belong to Jesus, but the future now belongs to the thief. And for that, we praise God.
when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. The 18-year-old young man had already attempted suicide twice. The torment and isolation were simply too great. Now, away from home for the first time, he wrote the careful letter to his parents. Dear Mom and Dad, there is no easy way to say this. I am gay, what you call homosexual. I need your help and your love. Who else could understand me? He waited. Five days later, the envelope came. With fear on the edge of terror and hope that he dared not admit, he opened the paper and found its only contents his birth certificate, torn into pieces. The word of Christ at the moment of his greatest agony was a radical word of love and grace. His message? You belong to a family which not even death can destroy. Earthly fear or ignorance, weakness or bigotry, even violence, may tear into pieces the world's affirmation of your value and goodness. But I say to you, there is a God who surrounds you with the love of a true mother and the faithfulness of a true child. That love and faithfulness may not be where you had hoped or yearned, but it is there. I give it to you without condition. Woman, behold your son. Son or daughter, behold your mother.
my God, my God, why? The most human cry from the cross was not that statement which articulated a biological need, I thirst. It was rather the critical question which pointed to a theological need. From Job through Jeremiah and from Samuel through the psalmist, the question, why, had been raised by people of faith. Why? Why do the evil prosper? Why has cancer attacked my body? Why me? Why did God let my child die? Why did God take away from me the one person who made life meaningful for me? Why won't God answer me? Why has God forsaken me? Jesus cried out in anguish from the cross these same words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some say he was quoting Psalm 22.1 as he felt the full weight of abandonment. He felt that he had been abandoned not only by those who fled in the garden, not only by those who thronged the path leading into Jerusalem, not only by the many who followed him from Capernaum and Nain through Jericho, hanging on his every word and bringing their sick to be healed by him. He felt that he had been abandoned not only by Peter, James, and John. Most devastatingly, he felt that he had also been abandoned by God. And to be abandoned by God is the ultimate abandonment. The agony of his soul brought the words of Psalm 22 to his mind. Many of us have felt what Jesus felt that day. Many of us still wrestle with that ultimate faith question. And to that question, God responds through the prophet Isaiah. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame consume you, for I am the Lord your God. Fear not, for I am with you. We are not forsaken or forgotten. Emmanuel means God is with us, even when we feel abandoned.
I thirst, he said. I'm sure he did thirst. We've all read, perhaps, of soldiers who lie dying on battlefields. They call out for their mothers, and they call for a drink. Crucifixion is death by asphyxiation. The lungs fill with fluid, and one drowns, standing nailed stock still above the ground, nowhere near a body of water. Jesus had thirst. For all the fluid in his lungs, he was desperate for a drop on his tongue, so rough and dry and stuck to the roof of his mouth. They answered his request, but what did they give him? Sour wine gone to vinegar, one last indignity. They mocked him as they honored his last request. He had thirst, and they gave him foul drink. We thirst, whether or not we know that we are dying. We, too, call out for our thirst to be slaked. We thirst for righteousness. We thirst for wisdom and understanding. We thirst for healing and blessing. Bloodthirsty, we may thirst for revenge. We may thirst not just for water, but for living water, for the Christ of God, for redemption, for the cool drink that will mean we never thirst again. He thirsted, and they, we, give him sour wine. We thirst, and he gives us drafts of cool, clear, living water. When we call out in our deepest need or pain, he will meet it. For what shall we thirst, then, sisters and brothers? Shall we thirst for those things that taste sweet but that never satisfy? Or shall we thirst for that which meets the needs of our dried-out souls? With what shall we slake the thirst of those parched people in our midst? When they call out for the water that gives life, what shall we offer them? Nailed to crosses of debt, disease, bigotry, and warfare, shall we offer them the wine we no longer want because it has gone bad? Or shall we share our store of clear, clean, cool water that refreshes and restores? When those who suffer say, I thirst. Shall we be as a centurion to them, soak a sponge with sour wine and offer it to them at the end of a long pole? Or shall we gently take their heads in our arms and pour sweet living water over cracked lips and rough tongues? It is so easy to dismiss the thirst of the suffering, but let us remember Calvary. It is so easy to dismiss the meanness of bystanders, but let us remember Calvary. Let us remember we who thirst, we whose cups are filled with living water, we who today hear Jesus say, I thirst.
Joy and sorrow mingle. A good and faithful servant has gone home. A carpenter, God's only begotten son, had pleaded, let this cup pass from me. But he drank the dregs to the last drop. God's judgment on the world would not be denied. Christ's earthly sojourn ended in the same death meted out to traitors and to criminals. It was finished, only to begin. Centuries later, another faithful servant met a cruel end. As he was summoned to his execution, anti-Nazi martyr and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer told those near him as he handed one his Bible, this is the end for me, the beginning of life. It was finished only to begin. A clutch of memories from childhood, snatches of half-forgotten words and images, a funeral, one of my first, my paternal grandfather, a heart attack, my father's grim face, my mother's tears, my grandmother's stunned silence, the pastor speaking of a Christian life well-lived. My grandfather, another carpenter, had collapsed as he worked on the beams of a new addition to our Savior's Lutheran Church. He died in the church in which he was now sent forth to be buried, recalled to his God. I heard the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. For him, too, it was finished, only to begin.
We all die. Perhaps the jab of a bayonet in our belly, or poison gas pouring through a shower nozzle, or an exploding jet or the crash of a truck, or a thundering commuter train against our car, or a bullet in our brain, or a ruptured heart. Or death may take us more slowly. A lingering stroke, a slow-moving cancer, failing lungs, collapsing kidneys. However we die, it is in terror. Whether the terror be momentary or long. Our lives, our failed dreams, our blighted hopes, our mistakes, our failures, our sins, our moments of joy, our interludes of love, our seasons of happiness, all are snuffed out. We die by ourselves or surrounded by family and friends, but we still all die alone. We face the terror alone. We enter the darkness alone. We give up all that we have and all that we were alone, but not quite alone. When Jesus died, he promised us, in effect, that when it came time for us to go down into the valley of death, he would go with us. He promised us that he knows what it is like, and he will aid us and protect us on this most dangerous of journeys. But not only Jesus. Our faith tells us that the God who is with Jesus and in Jesus will be with us too. God walks down the steep and dark road into the valley of death. We are not alone after all. The last seven words of Jesus are also our seven last words. The words of terror and loneliness, of fear and horror, of despair and final surrender as we complete our journey and perhaps begin a new one. Yet they are not words without hope. Jesus knew that the God who was with him, even among the dead, would vindicate him, that he would return to the valley of death to live again. Jesus promises us that he will hold our hand on the trip down and on the trip back. On Good Friday, we ask whether we can face death with hope, even as Jesus did when he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit.
Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, la tierra tembló, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were now raised, an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, que ha resucitado de los muertos. Now when the centurion and those with him 
who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and, and the things that had happened, they fear greatly, saying, Verdaderamente, este era hijo de Dios. Truly, this was the Son of God. Thank you. 